G'day legends, welcome to the Noob Spare Podcast. My name is Shrek and I host the Suckets, interviews with spearfishing experts, authorities, legends from around the world. Today it's someone from my own backyard, it's Brad Corbett. He is at Zulus64 on Instagram, really cool guy, I share a bit in common with him as well, so I've even had a chance to dive with him uh, since as well. And uh, funnily enough, we chatted in this interview with him about this sail and spear adventure that I am about to embark on running a trip with Eckhart Benkenstein up off the Whitsundays and exploring the Outer Reef off the Whitsundays. Uh, if you guys are interested in doing any of those sort of spearfishing trips with me, um, go to spearfishingcourses.com.au and you can find all the spearing courses as well as the trips and charters that are hopefully going to start popping up more and more and more. I've even got an intermediate spearfishing course starting uh, based on the request of a few different frothers. And our, my beginner course, the first one of September, is already sold out. Uh, we even oversold it, so it's pretty cool. I had to bring on another instructor. So check them out, spearfishingcourses.com.au. Hey, today's interview is kind of like a highlight on International Friendship Day. I shot it in the Adreno Aspley store up in the north of Brisbane. Um, the store is shut on a Monday, so Brad joined me there, and uh, we got to video it. Uh, this video podcast is actually up and fully available on the Adreno YouTube channel. Uh, it's probably got 12 views because of the <laughs> – no, no, I'm just joking. Uh, it, it is probably doing pretty cool. But if you want to watch the podcast for a change, go to the Adreno YouTube channel and watch it up there. Hey, bit of bad news. Uh, Honolulu, uh, some news come out. A big island teen, 17 years old, drowned while spearfishing. Um, his family devastated by his untimely death and um, obviously turning to their faith. Uh, they are YWAM uh, workers as parents and um, pretty pretty tragic striking a 17 year old while he's out spearing so uh, send in love and best wishes to the the family like um, this these things these things rock out our spearfishing world and um, we all do this thing that we love and you, you wouldn't wish it upon anyone so um, yeah Yo Johan Johan Choi so Anyway, uh, hectic, hectic note to get started on. Um, as usual, I'll do a, an incredibly awkward segue. I, I had a fantastic review for the News Show podcast. Reviews go a long way, guys, for helping other people find the podcast. This one, like Vegemite for your ears, rich and smooth, says Josh from Apple Podcasts in New Zealand. He says, the best thing for keeping the spearfishing froth alive when you can't get out for months at a time. Always a great listen. Shrek is the man. Very kind, Josh. Thank you very much, mate. Uh, Conrad and Jackson. Jackson left, Jack left me a voice message. Have a listen to this right now. Hi, guys. My name is Jackson, and I like spearfishing because I get to see and learn all about the fish. My dad and I go spearfishing at Seal Rocks and Jervis Bay. The fish I have caught so far are whiting, mullet, literature valley, and red mullet. Awesome, Jack. Thanks for that, brother. Uh, and Conrad, as usual, uh, a, a faithful patron and absolutely nothing but love for that family. Father and son combo, getting out there and spearing. Los, Los Angeles Fathomiers, the 55th annual scramble meet, going strong since 57. August 19th, 2023, weigh in at 3 p.m. sharp. It's at Wilders Edition Park. T-shirt, food, drinks, raffle, 1000 West Paseo del Mar, San Pedro, California. Check it out. For rules, registration, visit fathomiers.net. Uh, uh, fathomiers? Anyway, hey, you don't have to put up my terrible pronunciation. We're going to get into it. Brad Corbett. I, by now, I'm heading out on my Wood Sundays adventure, and the next couple of episodes will hopefully be from that trip. But here we go. Let's go. Brad Corbett, Zulus 64. Adreno stocks equipment for Nobis. The gear you need for all things freediving and spearfishing. The Adreno spearfishing team froth on helping customers learn about the latest in spearfishing equipment, local diving, upcoming trips and events for spearos of all levels of experience. There's no ego in there. You're going to meet cool people that love the spearing lifestyle as much as you do. Visit them in store in one of their huge mega stores around Australia. Chat to one of their friendly team members. Take advantage of the Noob Spiro discount code. Save $20 on every purchase over $200 in store, online, easy savings. Pump in the code Noob Spiro if you're shopping online or in store. Mention it's one of their friendly team members and save 20 bucks over 200. That's right, use the code Noob Spiro in store. Shop with Adreno, our partner for more than 200 episodes. I was left with an empty cooler after missing and wounding a bunch of fish with a shoddy spear gun. 
A work colleague urged me to speak to Neptonics, and I'm so glad I did. Without Jerry and the Neptonics team, I would have kept missing bulk fish and coming home to my wife empty-handed. Now I can focus on slaying monster hogs and groper and covering the deck of my boat in blood. Never buy a shitty piece of equipment again. Shop Neptonics.com, use the code NOOB10 to save 10% and go spearing with confidence. Jerry says, if we sell it, we believe in it, we trust it and dive it. Shop Neptonics.com, free shipping for the lower 48 for orders over $199 and you can save 10% when you use the code NOOB10, N-O-O-B-1-0 at Neptonics.com. Hoorah! Hey, g'day, guys. Uh, welcome to the Noob Spirit Podcast. Today, I'm joined by Brad Corbett. Uh, we are in the Adreno Aspley store. Uh, it's pretty cool to be able to do an interview in store and not have a huge crowd because I always get like uh, massive like stage fright as well. And uh, so it's pretty cool just to have a good old yarn in the store while it's shut. So, um, Brad, mate, I didn't know you were an ex-correction officer as well. Or yeah, that's true. Yeah, yep. yeah. So we share some uh, some common ground here. We're both uh, incredibly deep divers with massive beards and we're uh, <laughs> air correctional officers. I feel like this interview is going to be a winner. It's going to be good, mate. <laughs> yeah. Mate, um, whereabouts do you live and dive? What sort of your day, um, day? I live down in Burley and I dive. My local dive is off Tweed, around that Tweed, Tweed area and um, Gold Coast area. We're about to celebrate World Friendship Day too. I know um, being a good buddy is something that you like to do yourself. Yep. You also like to have a pool of good buddies. Uh, talk to me about uh, a recent experience you've had of a, of a good buddy and then it would be great to hear the opposite side of it as well. Yeah, um, there's a few guys I dive with um, off the coast and one, one mate in particular I really enjoy diving with because when he dives – I'm watching him and as he comes up, i got eyes on him for like 30 seconds when he's up the surface, all good. And then I don't even have to think or look around for him. So when I dive, I know he's got my back, he's watching me. When, I'm, when I pop up the surface, he's there. Like it's just, we work in sync, we know how we dive and it's just makes for a fun and really safe dive. So, mm-hmm. What are the other advantages to diving with a good buddy? Like um, having it, like if anything were to happen, like your buddy's there to help out, assist, mm. if you shoot a decent sized fish and... The fish is like needs a second shot. You know, your dive buddy will go down, check on the shot placement to see if it's secure enough. If it's not, he'll put a second shot in. Or sometimes he might be like, "Hey, do you want a second shot?" Yeah, put a second shot in. They're there as a backup, guaranteed to land the fish, and everyone's happy. What about comms? You comms? guys do like a lot of non-verbal stuff. Like, you're a bloke with a beard, so a lot of our communication is grunting. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but in the water, like, how, do, how does it work out? Have you guys got hand signals? Like, um, uh, how are you letting people, let your mate know what's going on? Sometimes just, yeah, hand signals or it's always, we just take turns of diving. So if I've dived, then he knows he's going to go next without any hand signals. Or if we get on the water, um, if we don't say anything on the boat, we'll generally I'll point at him and be like, you dive first kind of thing and he points at me or you dive and just thumbs up or they're okay and then just sort of go over there. It just sort of works in sync and yeah. Yeah, right. It's funny some of the awkward convos you have like, or, like you, you know, there's a good ledge or something and you're like, hey, like if you just put punch that way, there's a, there's a good opening up there. It looks like it's holding bait or something. How, how do they work out? Do you got, are you got to share fish and opportunities equally? Because some, some guys treat it like it's almost like a competition. Yeah, I can, I can definitely see how that happens. Um, I think it's just respect and mutual respect with like where you're diving. Like if you already dived that ledge and you come up and like, hey, there's a mangrove jack under that that ledge there or there's something else down there, go have a look and then they'll go down and have a look. Um, vice versa kind of thing. Um, most of the guys I dive with aren't like competitive like that, sort mm. of like work as a team and we sort of like – cheer each other on when we land a fish so yeah 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 those stoke moments on the surface yeah that's it definitely the high fives and the like you know when you watch your mate shoot a pb like i was over in wa late last year i've shared the story before but like i was on the bottom sort of on the edge looking out over sand and there was some fish there was a lot of fish sort of hanging out just beyond that range and a manta ray coming straight over top of me i didn't even know it was there and then i looked up on the surface and my mate could see the whole thing and it, it covered me completely you know yep. and it was cool to be able to like like it's good it's nice having gopro footage and stuff other people can kind of share 
But like having a mate there is like even even cooler. I the experience, yeah, definitely. Yeah. And the serious side of things you were telling me before we jumped on, like uh, you've helped a mate with a loss of motor control, an LMC or a Samba, depending on what mm. language you want to use. Walk us through what happened there. Uh, it was a couple of years ago with an experienced diver. He dove deep and he was down for quite a long time and I seen him coming up from the bottom and he was dragging a big um, gold spot tusky, mm. pretty much skull dragging it and um, he was sort of kind of rushing and I sort of seen he was a bit like moving pretty quick and a bit like – I guess you say like uncomfortable. A, yeah, uncomfortable. Or, yeah, and he got to the surface and um, he started having a somber. Mm-hmm. And I was probably like three or four meters away from him. And I knew straight away what was happening. And describe what you saw. Um, he so he up, was laboured on the way up. He was clumsy in his movements. A little, a little bit. Yeah. And he was rushed, so I knew he was pushing him, pushing his limits. Mm. And as he got to the surface, he just. Within a second, just started doing the whole somber shake and um, yeah, the Harlem shake. The yeah, sort of the, yeah, yeah. And um, I knew straight away what was going on, so I've gone over to him yep. to assist him. And him being an experienced diver, he's rolled on his back to um, I don't know to to, to make sure his yeah. face is clear. So yeah, he can pretty get much. Yeah, yep. he's rolled on his back, so he knew what was going on. Yeah. And I've gone under him, and I put my hands under him, and I was like, "Breathe, mate, breathe." And talking to him and he's talking back to me and I was like, you just let me know when you're right, mm. when you're good. And he's like, yeah, I'm good now. I was like, sweet. Kept an eye on him and then we just jumped back in the boat and he's like, that's that's me done that's for the day. That's you for the day. Yep. And he's like, thanks, mate. And I was like, no worries. Like, yeah. There's a number of cool takeaways from that. Um, where did you learn how to pay attention on that critical moment when your mate's about to surface and how did you know sort of what to do? Um once say it's from experience of that happening because that's the first time I've seen that happen in the water. Um, I think it's just about being a good dive buddy, being aware of what can happen, um, learning those things through like even like free dive courses. You learn like rescue, like buddy rescues and stuff. Um, yeah, that obviously the first time it's happened, but I just knew mm. what to do and. So bl- blowing across their face because we've got those nerve receptors under the eyes, that can help bring someone or help them stay conscious because mm. he's sort of on that verge of losing consciousness. You were tapping on his face and you were talking, you were saying his name, getting him to breathe. There was no screaming going on. It was all calm and collected. Yeah, it was all calm. You, you just pretty much helped bring him back to normal consciousness. Pretty much, yeah. I just held him there yeah. until he was, his body was all good and he wasn't shaking. And He must have been yeah. grateful he had a good buddy that day. Yeah, I'd hope so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Mate, I would be like, I'm 125 kilos, so I just look for dive buddies that can actually carry me up. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but uh, it's a lot of person to move in the water too, and it's quite a clumsy thing as we were discussing earlier. Um, when you did your freediving course, was that a big part of what you learnt, like how to handle someone when they're unconscious and how to hold them, any of that sort of stuff? Did you take his mask off his face or anything like that? At that time I didn't because yeah. he, was, he was conscious and – he was looking at me and he was talking to me, so I sort of didn't think to take it off. But I guess it was a different situation where he wasn't conscious. Then take his mask off and do what was needed. But he was conscious at the time, and I learned how to. Um, when I did my free diving course, I did it later in my spearfishing journey, and um, I should have done it a lot sooner because I learned a lot. But yeah, how to um, how to hold someone, how to grab someone, even like when they're not on the surface, but at depth as well, like mm. the techniques and that. Mm. Sometimes I think it doesn't really matter whether a freediving course comes sooner or later. If you do it later, like you, you almost have a lot more context to hang the knowledge on. Yeah, that's true. And it's yep. like it, um, you can immediately see how it's going to apply to your spearfishing and then maybe how some of it is not 100% like for what we do, you know. Yeah. Like because um, spearfishing is different from freediving but we can learn a lot from a lot yeah, of it. Yeah, definitely reckon. learn a lot. Yeah. Mate, talk about a froth moment like – a time where you like you would just like I always see you guys you're at the boat ramp down there tweed holding up all these massive yeah. fish you guys always look like you've had a good day out um, talk about like one of those moments where you get up to the surface and you guys are all high five and something memorable from recently um, there was one good time off off Morton when I shot my first Wahoo and um, I had my mate I had two mates one one young fellow was in the water and it was his first time sort of like deeper diving and I shot the wahoo and 
he was um he's like oh what do I do I was like mate chase after it put a second <laughs> shot in it put a second shot in it and we're both just working working together to, to bring the fish in and yeah. um I think it was about 20 minutes of playing with this fish until it died in the ass and then we finally got it back on the boat and as I was lifting the fish up with two hands on the side of the boat my mates picked it up and he's like holy crap this is a big wahoo like your first wahoo well done we got on the boat gears tangled everywhere yeah and we're just like frothing we're stoked we're high-fiving we're just like yeah. just just unbelievable and we're all yeah. just like cheering each other on and it was all teamwork too like it was you know they have a dive buddy in the water helping there was my mate in the boat he was like keeping an eye on us he threw another gun in for us like mm. to put like a third shot took three shots to slow it down so just that alone was amazing and then getting at home at the boat ramp and just just still on a high from it yeah that was that was a very memorable time what a go would it weigh um of memory i think it went 25 or 26 yeah nice yeah. man i still haven't shot one eh? yeah like um but they just everyone seems to fire on them they're a pretty special fish yeah that'd be cool to do it with your mates too like yeah. you say like um i think there's a mentality that's changing in spearfishing like it's like we do view it more as a team and i think up here particularly sort of northern new south wales southern southeast queensland we're diving current we're diving deeper water uh deeper reef a lot of the time a lot of the guys up here are really competent, but you, it's not a kind of diving you want to do by yourself. No, definitely not. Mm. It's definitely, I agree, like a lot of current viz. Um, it's, I'd say it's hard diving, but if you're competent as a diver, like it's doable and if you've got good dive buddies, you've got a good team, good crew, good mates to do it with, then like it's anything's achievable out there. With in saying that, you still got to respect the ocean. Mm. So if it's getting too rough or it's too much current and it's not feeling safe or you're diving and then your buddy's way off that way because of the current, it's kind of like mm. it's a bit sketchy. And so there's nothing wrong with you like saying, oh, let's pull the pin today. It's just getting a bit unsafe. Mm. You're an ex-military bloke. Like yeah. um, one of the great things I find about working with ex-military people, um, emergency services, everyone's kind of um, – understands that when you're in high risk situations a hierarchy and having very direct uh communication is actually like uh it's not rude we're not being polite this is something that we do, we use to mitigate risk talk to me about how that works on your guys boat and um do you find yourself um taking a leadership position with your crew or how, how does it work i know i'm maybe putting a lot of language on some mm. stuff and it's it's a lot more informal than that but I think when you have this sort of background, it sort of naturally lends to this sort of dynamic. Would you agree? Or um, yeah, I guess so. I, I always find that whoever whoever's boat you're on, they're they're owning the boat. They call most of the shots. Um, respect them. Respect what they say on their boats. Um, um, but even saying that, if you feel like something's unsafe, like you can speak up. It's all about communicating because if you don't say anything, no one's going to know. Um, Myself, I, I found in the past, I think because of my experience in um, working in corrections, um, I can get a little bit like short, short, but it's not like in a mean kind of way. It's kind of just like just trying to make sure everyone's safe and everything's running smooth because like I'm really big about safety and like mm. if something were to happen, it's it comes back on me or the boat owner. Um, yeah, but it's also you got to be calm as well and like just slow everything down and mm. yeah. yeah. When I was up north on an Adreno charter, um, we had this weird thing. There were like four boats out and two blokes at the same time stabbed themselves. <laughs> <laughs> and um, w one of them was on the radio like literally calling in like um, we we've got serious like um, a stab wound here and he's coming back in. And then we were like on the radio, we're coming back in too. And <laughs> another guy's done the same thing. And um, the guy on our boat, it wasn't as severe, but he had more or less just dropped a really sharp knife straight into his leg, I believe. Oh. And um, I was coming from a corrections background and um, I remember putting on a pair of gloves to help oh, treat yeah, him. Yeah. And, uh, and it all come back to me like, because in corrections when you're putting on a pair of gloves, normally you're attending an incident. Yeah, that's know? right. Yep. And you're getting ready to deal with like potentially hostile people and stuff like that. 
And it was actually nice to be putting on a pair of gloves to be helping someone <laughs> <laughs> rather than the officer. Do you, do you, how do you feel like you react in um, emergency situations? It definitely, I think having this kind of background helps. So you don't you don't have that that sort of. Some people have a real fear, strong fear response. Yeah, and other people just sort of settle down into this like controlled response mode. Does that help you when you're in these sort of yeah, situations? Yeah, definitely. Like any situation situation i've been i've always found myself like everything just gets slowed down i'm aware of what's going on i'm like quick to take action to assist to help mm. um it's a like not even just an emergency but when we're in the water with the, with the boys spear fishing like like i just my brain just goes in action mode like as a quick story one of the boys shot a um would have been a, roughly a 70 kilo black marlin off toy. Oh, yeah. yeah and he shot it with a real gun and i was like in my head within a split second, I'm like, he just shot that with a real gun. <laughs> and I just dove down without even thinking, dove down, unhooked my float line off my gun and hooked on his gun. Oh, beautiful. And he's let go. And then we went from there and got another gun, another float, and we, we got it in. He's like, oh, thanks so much for... for quick response. Yeah, quick response. And it's just like, it was just automatic. Like, mm. Um, mm. So I think it's it's good to have that within yourself. And 100%. Also, and also your, your mates you dive with, you know, that you can rely on them if something yeah, happens. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Whatever it would be. A lot of the time too, like it's a trained response. Like you, you don't start off that way. You get that way from experiencing being in those situations. Yep. And then you learn how to respond better. And as long as you're a person that sort of reflects on things and you take an improvement away from everything yeah. you do, it's a good good thing. Do you give a lot of feedback to the blokes you dive with? Like uh, particularly the new guys? New guys, yeah, I try to give feedback. I always like... Right. I'll ask them, hey, do you want any feedback? Like, or if I see them, they might be doing something wrong or their finning techniques wrong or they're diving down and they're going on an angle instead of straight down. About, yeah. oh, hey, just noticed you're diving like this or you're kicking like this. Like, I suggest you try this and and just sort of give the feedback. And yeah. It's so massive, eh, diving on an angle. Yeah. Even really experienced guys do it. Particularly when you're in current, you find yourself heading or working into the current on an angle away yeah. from it and you – like if you're diving in like 60 feet of water, mate, it means you're doing a 100-foot dive That's to right. get to the bottom. Take, you know? Taking you longer, more energy. Do you see the corkscrew as well for some people? If they've got a, Have you seen that where one fin stroke is more dominant than the other? No, I actually haven't. Yeah, yeah. No. Yeah, I mean, these, but these are like common faults. And they, I mean, a good dive buddy will tell you, you know, and if you yeah. don't have ego and you're just like willing to learn and listen. like Yeah, it's all about just educating mm. other divers. And you, like I hope that any of my mates that see me doing something wrong or right or – need improving like i'd expect them to tell me and take it as on as a learning educational thing yeah, yeah. that's how we all get better eh? yeah that's the rising right. tide yeah. um float lines you touched on it with this uh marlin like that's a great reason to have a have a float yeah, definitely. um diving off queensland too though heaps of us dive with um real guns yep. um and it is a more advanced form of spearfishing because um like you said before, like if you shoot something and you've got a float line, you can just potentially let everything go, swim to the surface, you're all good. Yeah. But a lot of guys want to go straight into like super alpha hunter mode with their <laughs> real gun, land on the bottom. Um, talk to me about your sort of – your how you view this sort of system, these two setups. Um, every, yeah, everyone's different. Me personally, I don't even own a real gun. I've always used a float and a float line. Um most of my mates use real guns and they're really good at using real guns, um, no issues, but they've been spearing for a fair while and quite experienced and they usually have a belt reel as well, so that extra line. Um, I've been thinking about getting a real gun to put on my small roller but just haven't really bit the bullet and done it yet. I'm too, I think I'm too afraid of letting go, thinking it's on a float line and losing everything. Yep, and you do that too. Yeah. Like the, the, you do that a few times, like having yep. done it, that sort of change over myself. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and it's a potentially like $1,000 Yeah, to, down the drain. I've already lost a um, roller gun before, so that wasn't, <laughs> wasn't a good experience. Trevor Ketchan, he works here at Adreno. He always says like don't, don't use a roller gun unless you're pretend, prepared to lose it. If, unless you can afford to lose it as well because yep. it's $1,000 like some people, Easy. you know, yeah. So it's a lot of money to potentially let go because yeah. you, um, if it's a battle between you going the surface and you getting a fish, um, the smart choices always go to the surface. Yeah. But I think definitely how, how, many, how much diving do you want to – do you think guys should possibly have under their belt before they would even consider making a decision oh, to go to a real a good question. I actually don't know. Um, 
Well, you've done a lot and you yeah. still haven't done it. No. So well, that speaks about it to me. Yeah, like I just like all the like the plus sides of having a float line, the safety side of it, um, having a, a float on the surface for boats, for your other dive mates to see. They can see when you're down, where your line is. Um, if you, you're like mono line gets caught up on the reef or your spear gets stuck on the reef and you can't like, especially in current, you can't get it off. Mm. You can just let it all go, come back with the boat, dive down and, and get it later. And that's happened to me a number of times. Yeah. Where I'm like, if I had a real gun, like I'd probably lost, would have yeah. lost a few guns. Like, Unless you had a mate that just clipped onto it really yeah. fast for you. Or the boat had a, had something like, and they were onto it and they were in the right yeah. spot. But yeah, you're right. It's just a great mitigation strategy yeah. for not losing um, current. I think there's pros and cons with them both. Mm. It's just, each their I was own. going to talk to you about structure. So like one of the big benefits of a real gun is like when you want to, and this is again, it's a more advanced type of diving, but yeah. going into caves or into artificial structure and stuff like that, like if you don't have a float line, it means less entanglement potentially. That's right, yeah. Is that, how do you get around that with a, with your float line? Because um, I've been using float line my whole life, I, I'd say I've got pretty good what I call line management. So I know where my float line is, it floats, um, if I'm diving around structural caves, I know where my float line is behind me. I always look back and like, oh, it's it's a bit too close to the rock there, a ledge or up. Oh, it's caught up there. I'll just go back and unhook it, kind of thing. Um, it, that can be a nuisance for like more reef diving, where a, a real gun would come in handy. Mm. Um, but if you if you don't have much experience around shallow reef with a float line, then it can be a bit of a pain in the ass. Mm. Um, so you coil it, carry it in your left hand, is it? Yeah, yeah. Or yeah. you get a shark clip and you can like halve it. Yeah, that makes sense. Or make it shorter, which I um, would do often. Like even around like spear fishing or fads, mm. I do that. I'll half the float line. So then you know float lines not going that way around yeah, the fad, around, the around fed, that way. Yeah, and that's yeah. happened a few and, times. Yeah. And 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 dolphin fish or mahi mahi, which you're targeting a lot out there, yeah. they they go ballistic. Too. Yeah, they go nuts. So. And then um, it's a recipe for getting a good tangle around the fad. Yeah, but I I mm. think going back on the question of like how much experience do you need before you get a um, real gun? Mm. I guess you could say you feel confident that you can use a real gun. Um, a lot of people walk into the shop and feel confident when they haven't yeah, been out though. Um, so sometimes like like I'm not saying – like if you're a confident, <laughs> competent sort of person generally in most types of things you do in your life and you walk into a spearfishing shop, sometimes you can have this assumed level mm. of I'm, I'm going to be competent at this too. But the the reality is like even if you are a competent person, there's still this massive learning curve you've got to Definitely, go yeah. There's so, I'm still learning every day like Me too. all the time. Mm. Um, but I think, I think until you've – not mastered, but got good line management with a float line, and and pretty competent to use that. Um, then maybe yeah, you go up to, to, a, to mm. a real gun if that's suited for you, or whatever. Yeah, yeah, each yeah. their own end of the day for it. But um, over yeah. in WA, a lot of the guys just refuse to um, start. They because they they blame you know they're always in structure. Um, but it's different. It's and I mean this is the reason why you join a club too, and you meet like local people because. I mean, the the context is everything too. Yeah, yeah. Also depends on like the, the terrain you're diving as well. Mm. So if you go up north off the Great Barrier Reef, real guns come in handy like, mm. massively. Yeah, big yeah. open water as well, and and sometimes you're not diving too deep That's either. Right, yeah, and it's clean. Everyone can see each other. Yeah, mm. yeah, yeah. Good point. It's so, sometimes it's a good idea for making the transition too. I think. Yeah, it's like you you have a real gun, but it's still connected to a float yeah. with a float. Yeah, line. you get used to. It how the reel works, mm. how the line comes out, mm. managing that line on the reel. Yeah, definitely. Mm. That's a good point. Do you have any preference with regards to your float and rig line? Like in terms of like what composition of line or? Um, I use a Rife float line, a 30 meter float line. It floats. That, that uh, the $400 a meter stuff? Um, yeah, I think it was expensive. That, that really nice super spectra type looking stuff. That, yeah. Yeah, it's beautiful. Isn't really, it? really nice gear. It floats. Mm. It's visible. Um, it's it's long enough for my diving. Like you want to have a, a float line that's long enough to your ability to dive because if you get a 15 meter float line and you're like getting competent at diving 20 meters, you'll be pulling that line down. So I still think like guys should start with a 15 meter line because um, when you start pulling it down consistently, it's almost like an indication like, oh, sweet, I'm starting to yeah. get like decent at that level. And then you can add a five-meter bungee or go and buy a, 
60 yeah. foot line or a 70 foot line. Yeah. It's almost like it's it's worth earning that the the le- the extra length of your line. But guys, yeah, experienced guys all, you know, yeah, 30 so, meters. Do you, well, have you have you had it hold you up though? Like when you're in current and you want to go a bit deeper and your line's fully stretched out? Yeah. Had that a few times. Yeah, cuz I had a I I started on a small length of line and then I remember having a 20 meter and getting 20 meters and pulling it down. I'm like like Frustrating. can't go anymore. So I end up buying a 30 meter, which is like long, but it's plenty. And um, and I run a big like Adreno yellow float, 30 liter float. Oh, uh, like the Remora type ones from um, I don't know the ones you're talking about. Yeah, just the Speedmaster ones. Ah, there's, yeah, there's yeah, one, one over there. Yeah, yeah, there. yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's good. That 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 if you shoot big fish, that helps. Can you pump them up? Like how? At what yeah, just a bicycle tube thing. So you just go to. How, how how much do you pump them up? I pump it up just enough that you can compress it because oh. when it's in the in the sun, it expands. Yeah, Charles Law temperature yeah. expansion. Yeah, so that they're a good having a big float. Like it's visible for boats. It's helps with big fish. Mm. Um, even if you get tired, you can just put your body weight on it. it keeps you afloat. And yeah, you can yeah, rest on it. I've done that heaps of times. Yeah, that might have been handy with your mate that had the samba too. Like you can put it under someone and yeah, let someone have a good yeah. rest. Hey buddy, how's your breath hold going? Really? You struggling? I do too sometimes and that's why I've got something perfect for you today. I think you'll agree with me when I say that maintaining or even increasing your breath hold is a struggle, especially when you're not slaying fish every week. But what if I told you there was a way to train yourself easily and do it safely? Freediving for spearfishers at howtofreedive.com will help you to extend your breath hold understand your body better and put you in a better position when you actually get to go out spearfishing. This program, Freediving for Spearfishers, is not for noobs. Uh, It's for people who have some diving under their belts and understand basic spearfishing safety. But it's perfect for spearos who want a guided, easy to follow and complete program with videos, a clear process and a set goal. The goal is a five minute static. And check it out, Freediving for Spearfishers at howtofreedive.com. You can get started for free, do the taster, and if you do decide to purchase, use the code NOOBSPERO, N-O-O-B-S-P-E-A-R-O to save some money if you do decide to purchase. Check it out at howtofreedive.com. Hunting a job fish can be challenging. Throwing sand, hiding, hunkering down and minimizing your profile, all of these techniques and more are why we call it the Jobfish Dance. Celebrate the Jobfish Dance at noobspero.com with a sick range of gear made just for our community at noobspero.com. Get your hands on some Jobfish tribute gear only available at noobspero.com. Yeah, you have stressful times too. Like, um, talk to me about a time maybe where you've given yourself a fright or maybe you've learned something. Um, you had anything really scary happen to you? I wouldn't... I'd- haven't had a shallow blackout or I've come close to a somber where like I had the video rolling as well and I've watched, I've watched back on it. I've come up and um, I felt ting in the legs. I got a bit fuzzy in the eyes mm. and looking back on the video, you can see my head drop a bit like about here and I'm blowing bubbles. I'm kind of doing them things and I was like conscious enough to, to yell out to my mate, keep an eye on me and I was doing these ones, keep an eye on me because I knew that I was – close to the limits yeah nice um that was sort of a a bit of a i wouldn't say wake up call but it just makes you realize like how important it is to have your your mates there with you you know like Mm. if you're diving down you don't want them swimming away where they can't see you because if if i were to somber or black out they wouldn't know how's your recovery breathing or your hook breathing yeah good yep Yep, so is that something you sort of practice pretty often um is that your part of your normal dive? That's part of my normal dive. Yeah. I come up and I'm just like gulping air yep. massively. And yep. Yeah. Because that can help prevent a, a, a Samba or an LMC as well. Like if you if you just do that and practice it regular, that's yeah. cool. Getting that oxygen um, back in. The other thing you touched on too earlier with that experienced guy having the LMC, like when you're diving with experienced guys too, they tend to weight themselves appropriately. But when you're diving with – fairly new guys or sometimes guys that maybe like me they're not diving very much they're a little bit out of shape they want a bit of hand on their crap duck dive technique so they overweight themselves do you see that much because if you are overweighted and you come back up to the surface to breathe and you breathe out you're going to sink like yep. a rock i'm betting i'm betting your mate was weighted appropriately so he was already sort of yeah. quite buoyant yeah because he was weighted appropriately for the depths he was diving is that something you see though um no actually 
okay. which and I don't. I haven't seen anybody that looks overweighted. Mm. Um, everyone I dive with, even some of the newer guys, they all seem pretty pretty weighted well. Yeah, cool. Um, yeah. Some guys too, like I, like I head out shore diving and if you're diving like sub 30 feet before you dive, like it's quite good to be neutral at sort of two or three metres rather yeah. than 10, which is what we go for when yeah. we're out a bit wider. But just something, some guys, they just forget to take weights off as well and things like that. Mm. Yeah, but it does make a, a small difference to your diving, but it makes a massive difference if you have a blackout. So. Yeah, definitely for sure. Mm. So um, what about sharks? Love them. Yeah? Yeah. I yeah. went diving yesterday and we came across a few bronze whalers and um, I think they're just beautiful creatures. But with, with respect. Yeah. You've got to respect them. And, um, a bit like yeah. prisoners, aren't they? They, they, <laughs> they try to intimidate you. But yeah. you sort of, you know, like with a little bit of body language and a little bit of like confidence, you can deal with a lot of the, the sort of the – Harsh turns and the yeah. arced backs. I definitely believe that sharks can pick up your confidence and mm. your persona in the water. Yeah, yep. I always got. I always carrying a GoPro on my on my mask and um, like yesterday, for example, I seen the bronze whaler come in and he came in reasonably quick to check us out. So I dove down on him and swimming alongside it, and I always try and get close as I can, but it just kept kept its distance, and I kept swimming towards him, swimming towards him, and he kept his distance, and then eventually just buggered off. Yeah, but it's also about reading their body language, you know. Mm. Like if he was a bit sporadic and not acting like that, I'd be like, oh, okay, maybe we should get out of the water yeah, and yeah. change spots. But generally, from my experience, they're very curious and they just see you as another marine animal checking mm. you out. And um, What about bull sharks? Same thing. Like oh, okay. I've had the same experience with bull sharks, tigers and bronze whalers. Same thing. They come check you out. I'll dive on them. And swim towards them and just get good video footage and it's kind of like almost like oh shit what's this swimming towards me i'll keep mm. keep my distance that's my experience mm. um have you had a hard charge before no you had, yeah no yeah, i have i well i kind of have up on the sunny coast but like i hear what you're saying it's like you, you have this sort of this confident assumption that you know like and that and you project that into the water the sharks kind of sense that and yep. they they work with you yeah. but there are these times where you have to have this wisdom like when a tiger shark's in that mode where it's feeding it's like yeah i'm probably just going to get out yep. even if you move a kilometer away like the shark can cover that distance in 15 seconds yeah that's right but it's enough time for it to sort of bring the energy down mm. a bit and it changes a bit doesn't it yeah it's definitely reading the situation reading the shark um mm. yeah if a shark's charging you or getting too curious that's a bit like oh not sure about this. I might just move. Do you guys move a lot? Um, no, nah, no. I think over the years, probably maybe once or twice, we've moved yeah. spots because they were just sort of hanging around too much. You know, like you numbers. Is, numbers are a bit more of an intimidation factor too. Like yeah. one or two sharks is fine, but you get four or five of them and they're buzzing you yeah. every dive. It's like yeah, then you know they're like they know what's going on, and it's like you know if you're going to shoot a fish, then they want they, free. They're lunch. going for a free feed, and you're like. You might just move spots. Yeah, cool. Mate, you always shoot um, decent jewy. Have you got them tuned? Pardon? Jewfish. You always shoot decent jewfish, Mulloway. Um, I've only shot two. Oh, okay. Yeah, so Mate, Instagram, <laughs> Instagram has told a different story. Don't believe Instagram. <laughs> <laughs> well, what's one of your favourite species to hunt then? Um, Did you shoot your jewies like in close or out wide? The first one was off out off Morton. Somewhere I can't remember it was some – just somewhere it was, I don't know, 15 metres deep, just sort of overhang and there was a school of them. I was like, just stumble pond them. I, like, oh, I love that. Shot that one and one was off um, Tweed. Deeper? Um, no, nah, like, yeah, 15 metres, oh, wow. give or take. Like, yeah. Yeah. A lot of guys think you have to go super, either super deep or super shallow for Jewies. So, and you've shot both of them sort of that like mid-water yeah. everyday dive depth. I, don't, I honestly don't know the... Yeah, it's hard to say, like, mm -mm. trying to figure all that I stuff out. I hear I was thinking you were the Jew whisperer. No, nah, that's not bro. me. I, I landed you in it. <laughs> Love your honesty. <laughs> yeah, I'll be honest. <laughs> What's the species you like hunting and targeting regularly? Um, I like shooting or targeting black spot tuskies. Yeah. Just because they taste – they're probably my favourite fish to eat and they're good fight mm. as well. Um, that's another one I like to shoot. Now, we'll give us some tips on black spot. So oh, um, how, how, do you, how do you go with them? Are you, do you like um, bomb diving them or are you a bottom hunter? Bottom hunter. Yeah. They'll generally they'll just appear and 
literally like will just come, they'll come in, check you out, and you got to like they don't hang around for long. So you got to take that. They'll present themselves close enough to take a shot, mm. and so when they're there, you just take your shot because if you don't, they they're going to be gone. Mm-hmm. So, mate, some days you just um, I don't know when I don't get out for a while and then I go out, I make every mistake. Like known to man. Yeah. And it's a frustrating day experience. Do you ever have days like that? I had a few days like that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. What do you what are some of the common mistakes you make and how do you avoid doing it regularly? Rushing shots. Okay. It's definitely a big one of mine. Um, I've always got to remind myself just to slow down on the bottom. Um, and yeah, just taking your time with your shot because there's so many times where I've like I've gone to shoot fish thinking, yep, definitely got it. And then I look back at my video footage and it's just like I've just like skimmed the top of it or I'm just out of range mm-hmm. or they like have turned as you've taken the shot. It's because you've like flinched or that little bit of body movement, they can pick that up. So definitely um, definitely just slowing things down, definitely being relaxed. So Okay, so you're sort of saying a lot of your accuracy issues are connected to your own body language behaviour and the mechanics of you shooting. Yeah. Have you had issues with like the your gun setups or inconsistency with your setups or like talk about that if you can. Um, one most recent one is my flopper on my gun. So I've had the same um, shaft on my roller since I bought it and it's actually super rusty and the flopper's loose and I've tried to tune it but it's just not happening and for a while they were shooting fish and they were just coming off because the flopper was uh, engaging all the time i was mm. like super frustrated and i was like no nah, that's it I'm gonna bite the bullet and buy a new shaft and i used that shaft yesterday actually and i shot a nice um little mary cod and it just was dead on accurate i was just like yes <laughs> loving it so yeah it's definitely important to have maintain your gear properly everything's running right because it just it can Make the difference between oh, and fish and not. Hundred so. percent. I can completely relate to what you're yeah. saying too. Do you have a flinch with you? Like one of the beauties of having a GoPro on your head is that you do get to sort of analyze your footage yep. and see where you're going wrong. Have you noticed you've got a flinch? Are you compensating for recoil? I mean, because um, you must have noticed the difference between going from a roller to a conventional gun as well. Yeah. So I, from a conventional gun, I've got a fourteen hundred Rob Allen double um, rubber and. Yeah, two hands of that because it's got a big kickback. But I've noticed going to a roller, um, I still use like the two-hand technique on it, which like works fine, but but I've gotten used to using one hand, but still making sure everything's like squared away, straight, um, not moving too much. Yeah, bit of a transition, but... Did any of your marksman principles from firing a rifle come into yeah, spear guns? Definitely. Yeah. yeah, yeah, definitely. It's like instilled in me. Yeah. So, yeah, it's all about slowing down, even like um, pulling the trigger. You know, not not snatching it, but just a slow pull. And mm-hmm. like when you're firing a rifle, when you get taught that, it all comes into play. Even like looking down the barrel, all mm. that. Yeah. One of the other things we're pretty bad at in spearing is like none of us go out and practice accuracy. No. Like we don't fire a gun in or sight a rifle in like you do when you're hunting. Yeah. You know, like everyone, if you've got a new rifle, you take it to the range, you set up a bit of paper at 50 metres and you, you know, put a couple of, you know, rounds into it yeah. and then you slowly adjust and make sure you're all dialed in. We're spear guns. <laughs> no. We just go straight from the shop to the boat, out 20, you know, 20 miles, jump in the water, dive down and hopefully shoot a fish. Um, it's not real honouring sometimes to the fish, I think, but it's just like without having a swimming pool, like to just jump in and with targets set up, it's quite painful, isn't it, to, to sight a uh, spear gun in. Yeah, but I think it just comes down to trial and error. And mm. if you keep missing, you've got to keep re- reloading, that gets old real quick. <laughs> so it makes you sort of try. Be economical yeah. with your shots. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. Yeah, but hey, I don't know anybody that goes and tunes their gun in or practices Shooting in a pool. I went away on a big trip to New Zealand a few years ago and um, we were targeting big kingies off the Three Kings and I was using a breakaway gun. I'd never used one before. I went down to the Tweed River and I um, mounted a rubber target on an oh, old yeah. car in the river there. I know and, what you're talking about. Yeah, yeah, and I just punched a few through that. And that was cool because I, I, I took all four or five of my guns and I, I realised like two of them were just so woeful. Yeah, right. Yeah. That's a really good idea. Yeah. But it, it does take time. Like it's like we, you could go out for a spear, you know, and yeah. here you are lying in a river shooting <laughs> a rubber target on a car. Like it's not as much fun. No, but I guess if you 
can dial your guns in and you know they're accurate, then it or not pay accurate. Off. Yeah, as that's the case right. was with a few of mine. Yeah, they made me not really want to use them because you yeah. just want to have confidence when you pull the trigger, don't you? Yeah. Mm. yeah what sure. shafts do you run? Did you have you got a preference yet with brand? Um, I've always run the shafts that the guns come with, so mm. the Rob Allen guns with the Rob Allen shafts. That's smart. Yeah, because they've dialed that recipe in over a lot of testing. Yeah. And so you know that they've probably got it right. A lot of guys want to go in and retrofit everything. And it's like, well, it can be a good idea, but sometimes you're learning something that's already been tested yep. and they know it's not quite right, you know? Well, so. I, have, I, put it, I, put another, I have put another shaft on my roller once before a couple of years ago to try it out. Same thickness, same length, like everything, you know, but just a different shaft and whatnot and flopper mm. and had fins instead of the little in cuts in the yep. shaft and – it was just – I was missing fish mm. to the point. I'm like, this is so frustrating. Like I even missed a Wahoo one day with it and I was like, it was that close. It was like from me to your way. And I was like, how on earth did I miss that fish? They're the like, shots I miss. They're always the shots I miss oh, when I get too close. Frustrating. So I was like back to the shop and I was like, nah, I'm, I'm just going to get another um, shaft that's the same. As soon as mm. I put that same shaft back on for that gun, mm. it's everything. So I don't know why it was out, but mm. yeah. Learn from the best. Adam Stern's courses at freedivingfamily.com are written and presented by some of the world's best freedivers and most experienced instructors. Lessons learned come from years of freediving and teaching at the highest levels and are now condensed and available for everyone. Go to freedivingfamily.com, use the code SPIRO and get 20% off any course. Now there's Frenzel, Advanced Frenzel, Hands-Free Equalization, there's Mouthful and Deep Frenzel Equalization, even by finning Essentials. Get that finning technique right. It's the one percenters that make the difference in spearing and allow you to have more time on the bottom and you feel better even doing it. Go to freedivingfamily.com and use the code SPIRO to get 20% off any course. Adam Stern's courses at freedivingfamily.com. In the world of freedive spearfishing, there's no magic breathing technique that's all of a sudden going to get you down and shoot massive fish at depth and holding big bottom times. But there is a way to do it safer and smarter, take down more fuel to maximize the time that you have there. Learn at noobspero.com forward slash Ted with Ted Hardy from Immersion Freediving. If you take down more fuel, you can stay for longer. Learning to take a bigger breath is not such a big deal. Ted breaks it down for you with a free online course at noobspero.com forward slash Ted. Take down 20 to 30% more air just by learning how to take a full breath. Again, learn how to do it free at noobspero.com forward slash Ted. Are you in the market for a new spear gun? Killshot Spear Guns has got blue water wahoo tuna guns, open track spear guns, enclosed track spear guns, rear handle enclosed tracks. Check them out at killshotspearguns.com. Even better, I've got some good news for you. You can save $30 on any Killshot Spear Gun at killshotspearguns.com. Use the code NOOB. If you're in store, just say, crikey, mate, or say Shrek from the Noob Spiro sent you, and you'll save $30. Ed Martin at killshotspearguns.com. Check them out. You got some cheeky buggers in your crew. Have you, you guys have some fun times oh, out yeah. there? <laughs> Tell us a couple of gags. Um, oh, when, when we're ever out in the boat, it's just always a good time, always mm. good banter, just talking crap. Um, one of the boys is a bit of a larrikin. He always, he's always good to go diving with. It's always a fun time. Yeah. Go give us the story. Aquabog maybe. Oh, mate, we've got heaps of, <laughs> <laughs> we've got heaps of Aquabog stories. Yeah, right? it's my favourite. Yeah. It never gets old for yeah. me. One of the boys has got a good boat and it's good to do Aquabog off. Mm. Perfect platform for it. And um, one guy in particular, when we go out, he always gets the camera out and films and makes <laughs> a joke and it's just like awkward and funny and yeah, just, yeah, <sighs> just a good time. Yeah, I've had photos of me taken in the water with an aquabog before. I was just like, if I ever see that on social media, you're friggin' dead. I don't think they go they go past the boat, but mm. brown Mr. Whoopies. Yep. Mm. Good fun. Good times. Um, who's the larrikin? Name and shame. Who's your who are your who are your dive buddies? Um, which ones are the best buddies too? Like name and shame. So one one of my mates I go diving pretty often is Luke. He's got a good Haynes Hunter boat. He's always he's a really good dive buddy, good mate as well. Um, always got each other's backs. I've got a few other mates. I've got a mate, Damo. He, he's a good dive buddy. He's really good, become a really good diver over the years as well. Um, our mate, Regan, he's, he's a larrikin. He's hilarious. Cracks me up. Cracks everyone up, actually. Like, yeah, we went on a trip um, early last year up, up north and 
Oh, he was the life of the party, eh? Classic. Yeah. Makes me laugh thinking about all the shit he says and does. Ah, uh, just a lyric in, in, every, in every sense of the word. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah, cool. Um, how often do you guys take out new people? Um, or, or, or guys that are still fairly sort of inexperienced? I won't say that often, but there are a few guys that um, – that like are experienced but still, I don't know, like somewhat new, I guess you could say, like or have experience. But um, yeah, like with the guys I go diving with, not that often actual new guys. Mm. Um, when I have a boat, it's not raining at the moment, but it will be soon hopefully, um, I'm more than happy to take new guys out Yeah, um, as long as they're willing to, to learn and have respect for the sport and – um, for the guys that, that are there diving with and just are willing to learn basically, like mm. especially about the whole safety side of things. like. Okay, so I'm a new guy. I'm coming out with diving with you. Walk me through um, five ways I could do it right and maybe a few ways I could do it wrong and um, I wouldn't get invited back. Definitely turn up on time mm. is a big one. Like That's massive. It's I always think, I don't know if it's me being harsh or not coming from my background of work, but it's like, well, if you're late, would you be late for work? Mm-hmm. Probably not. So why be late? You know what I mean? Like yep. I think it's important to be on time because if you're late, then you're holding everybody else up and everyone's just keen to get out there. Mm. Um, pitching wherever you can on the boat, um, pitching for fuel with ice. Generally when I was starting out, um, I learned to like always ask the, the owner, but hey, do you want me to grab a bag of ice? Or just grab a bag of ice anyway and bring it up. Like mm. that's like – It's always good to have more. Yeah, that's yep, right. Nice. Um, what else? Like even after you get back, help with cleaning the boat, ask, hey, do you need a hand with this? And if the boat owner's like, no, nah, you're right, mate, you can go. Like, all good. But definitely um, pitching in and offering to pitch in for fuel because in the, the day, the person that owns a boat, it's expensive to own a boat. Yeah. Like it. Bring out another thousand, I think it's. Yeah, pretty much. So like, you know, you got boat rego, trailer rego, you got maintenance of the motor, maintenance of the boat, maintenance of the trail. Like there's all the wear and tear. So. Mm. more like fuel is like the cheapest part of owning that's boat. right so mm. yeah if you can definitely pitch in for fuel highly recommend you pitch in for fuel and and if they say oh, it's 50 bucks for the day you know like sweet no dramas and mm. yeah if you put in and good attitude good attitude know. and you know like you definitely be asked back for sure like mm. yeah um i've had blokes get seasick and they fall asleep when they're boaty um I've had guys that uh, want to come in early because they've got night yep. shift. Um, to me, these are not things you do, particularly with people that aren't necessarily your mates. Uh, they're just people you're going spearing with for the yeah. day and you're kind of there on their goodwill. So you've just kind of always got to keep that in mind, I reckon. Yeah, I think so. Um, just, yeah, having respect as well. Like if you're going out with someone, they're like, oh, what time will you be back? I'm just saying, I don't know. Yeah. So if you've got work that afternoon or – Can't come. It's yeah. just like, well, I can't guarantee you're going to be back. Mm. But, <laughs> mate, like I've been out and guys, I hear when I come dive, I'm like, yeah, I'll come dive and what time are you going to – I'll be like, hey, do you have a rough idea? And they're like, oh, I'm not sure. And it's like, oh, I've got to leave for work at 2 o'clock or something. Oh, no, nah, we'll be we'll, – can't guarantee. I'm like, no, nah, we're good. Like I'll pass, but thanks. Yeah, anyway. yeah. Or sometimes I have gone out and they're like, yeah, I've got to do something in the afternoon so we'll be, make sure we're back before then. So it just all depends like – yeah. What about in terms of like training? So you got you got potentially new guys coming out. Um, if they have access to sort of training, like I know if you're in AM, AUFQ, a lot of the time they subsidise like um, uh, marine radio training, like uh, marine first aid, uh, your boat licence. There's, there's quite a lot of tickets and stuff you can do along the way. Do you, do you think they're all helpful? Um, do you think they're a baseline? I mean, what do you, what do you think? I think just having a boat licence is – Definitely handy. Mm. Or even just being competent in driving a boat. You know, yeah, like yeah. you can have a boat license and still not know how to drive a boat. It's a bit different in the river than out out at sea. Mm. Um, being confident in driving a boat, even just general like first aid knowledge is always handy for sure. Yeah, yeah. Tourniquets are massive, aren't they? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Do you do you carry them on your boat? No. How, what's your crew? I've like got a them? I've got a um on my boat when I have a, my boat running, I've got a first aid kit. Yep. Um, and all the other guys I dive with, they've got first aid kits. Like mm. just a basic sort of one. Yeah. Mm. I mean a major trauma is the biggest thing we're going to have to deal with. Like someone gets struck by a prop or a shark yeah. or something like that. That's all your dive knife as I saw. 
like before. Um, so learning how to deal with major bleeding, so I think pretty pretty cool. Yeah. Um, if you can get your head around it and practice it a few times. Um, yeah, awesome, man. Um, what about, What's your gear like from head to toe? You, you mentioned you're using a Rob Allen yeah. 1.4. What about in terms of wetsuit? And um, Yeah, I've got a Rob Allen 1400. I've got a 1200 roller, Rob Allen. I've got the, that big Adreno 30-litre float, um, the Rife 30-metre float line. Um, Suits? I've got a three and a half mil Rob Allen um, open cell and I've got a – I bought a Chinese five mil wetsuit, which is junk. No, oh, it's good. Yeah, it's lasting oh, yeah. two seasons so far and still going. So that was like cost me next to nothing. Yeah. Um, what else? I just got like basic like booties. And um, these these um three mil Ocean Hunter ones with this red plush lining in them. Yeah. I, I got a pair maybe a year ago. I don't think I'll wear another pair of booties there. Eh? No, <laughs> nah, that's super good, man. They're nice to put on. They're warm, yeah, right. comfortable. And I think the lining just lends well to helping your foot sit in a foot pocket all day. Yeah, okay. Because, like, you think about it, like, your foot's stuck in it and you're potentially finning for – like, I, I don't even like to go, Bodie. If someone says, oh, okay, Bodie, I go, okay. And then <laughs> – <laughs> mate, I'll swim all day. But, yeah. like, it's a lot of, like, time to have – your foot wet and inside a you know a rubber foot pocket that's not particularly ergonomically mm. designed for your foot. It's not like you go and get a, a moulded set. Yeah, that's right. So yeah, I, I like them. Yeah. But um, previous to that, I haven't been real fussy because you know you rock hop and you punch holes in them every day, yeah. and it's like it's cheap. Yeah, socks or cheap booties. What and Crocs. 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 Yeah, if you yeah. Rock hopping. A few mates wear Crocs. Yeah, yeah. They're they good on the boat they're, too. They're, they are actually really good at working mm. treat. Um, what else? I just got like two dollar Bunnings gloves. Yeah, oh, they got yeah. the the grippy stuff on the yeah, yeah. on the palm. How they go with the lobsters? Great. Yeah. I actually, when we yes, I grabbed the lobster. Just everything thinking, just straight on top, and don't don't feel much like. Do you get easterns where you're diving? Like uh, the uh, eastern rock lobster? They we call them a pack horse in New Zealand. I don't know if they range as far north as you are. Um, we got we got painted craze and I oh, still. We get – yeah, I can't remember the name of the other ones. They got yeah. a little more of a browner look to them. Yeah. Uh, you know, there's the a, Eastern. Yeah, there's there's four or five different yeah, I can't vegetarian ones we have, but they're yeah. all vegetarians. The Easterns are a carnivore though, so – but they're more of a temperate water species. I, th- I, I don't know if they come as far north as where you are, but, yeah, no, that's cool. All right, so it sounds like you're near, nearly sponsored by Rob Allen. Like you've just dropped Rob <laughs> Allen like 15 like times in so. this chat. <laughs> no, I just – I like the gear work. I like the gear. Yeah. It's a Toyota or a spearfishing really, isn't it? Yeah, it's a good analogy. I like that. Yeah, yeah. I like the gear. It works. It just comes off the shelf, ready to go. You don't really have to do anything. Like mm. it just works, does the job. It's durable. Like I don't even look after my gear really. Like I just wash it down, that's it. I throw it around. Yeah, it just works. So, Mate, you're in the same sort of part of the world as me and you have – sort of got out and done a few different trips and charters and stuff. Um, for guys that are on a budget, like let's say, you know, they're just everyday people, right? Um, what's some real good bang for your buck trips that you've done around this part of the world? There's one I've done a few times um, up north off, off um, Airly Beach. Mm. We have a company called ProSail. They do a, um, a dedicated spear fishing trip. It's five days out on the outer reef and live aboard on this big super maxi yacht um it even not just the spear fishing side of it but the whole experience like sailing on the boat the crew where you sleep what you eat the whole thing is like worth every cent like i highly recommend that trip because you just get so much out of it like it's un- and the spear fishing is unreal like mm. clear water all the time so many different types of fish like it's good that's definitely. A Did you have trip. much adjustment between spearing down here and spearing up there? Well, same, same. Just learning the species. Just yeah, learning the species, and it's just easier diving up there. I think because mm. you're not really battling current. It's not super deep. Um, good viz. Kind of spoiled up there. Yeah. So every time I come back from a trip down here, it's just like, oh man, oh. it's it's so much hard. Like it's harder work to spear mm. down here. You got current. Got less fish, green um, water. Yeah, the viz is hit and miss all the time. Mm. Yeah, mm. but if you can get it, do a trip up north, out on the outer reefs, anywhere, it's just highly recommended. Like it's worth saving the money up and doing it because it's a life of a, a trip of a lifetime, I should say. Yeah, <laughs> mate. 
couple of questions left before we head on out. Um, earlier you mentioned you, you don't mind a bit of seafood. Um, what's your go-to recipes and how do, how do you impress Crystal? <laughs> um, I've got a few recipes. Um, there's one good recipe that one of my good mates um, used to make and I, I called it – I can't remember what he, what he called it but I just called it like the special Thai fish dish. But I learned it from him and um, – I make it every so often now, and, um, and orchestra, it, orchestra. Oh, it's just like cooking, cutting the fish up in the pieces, chucking the pan, garlic and butter, some coriander, some chili. Make sure that's cooked, just cooked, so it's, the meat's still soft. Bit of rice, chuck that on. Soy sauce, a bit of um, coriander, some chives on top. Sprinkle a bit of that. Um, what's that? That sweet soy sauce you get. Oh, yeah, yeah. You know what I'm talking about. Yep. Sprinkle a bit of that on, and then you get. Um, I think it's peanut oil, or you can. Use, I use coconut oil in a small mm. pan with some chopped up garlic and ginger, and you bring that to the boil till that's like golden brown, and then you just like whoosh it on, or sizzle it on, and it goes. <laughs> and it's just like looks fancy too. Oh, it looks fancy. It tastes great. <laughs> yeah. That's one I like to do and then there's another – like it sounds like you've got all those Thai flavours going there, coriander, yeah. um, ginger, garlic yeah. and the soy. Yeah. I'd almost call it death by soy. It sounds good. <laughs> yes. Mate, yeah, good. I'm very partial to a fish dish. Have you have you done anything unusual with seafood? Have you tried anything weird? Do you like your sashimis or your Yeah, I love sashimi, yeah. Yep. Yeah. 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 One of the one of the boys we dive with, he does really good sashimi with all his fish. Like he always posts it online and it's just like – so good yeah yeah yeah. he loves it it's good it, it, it's like a lot of things in life you go to that little bit of extra effort and you get a lot more out of it yeah it's like um it's so like you're investing in the in the cooking process but the rewards always um are always worth the work yeah i think definitely mm. i also like getting a whole fish cutting slices in and it just lathering it in butter and garlic and chucking it in the oven no air fall nothing just in the oven and just let it cook and sizzle up and oh it's unreal. What's, what fish do you use a lot for that? What's your favourite um, species to use? Moses perch. Yeah. Sort of those reef species that are sort of like a good size to put in the oven, you know, I mean the cook hole. Mm. Yeah. That can take up the whole oven tray, you know, or two that will fit just on oven trays. Yeah, love it. It's good, yeah. Love it. Yeah. So you're a guy that spares to eat for sure. Pretty much, yeah. 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 Yeah, awesome, man. Well, um, I'll, we're going to have to get you a copy of 99 Spare Recipes. And, um, oh, that'd be unreal. Yeah, well, this just I'm, – I'm purely giving you one for, for the promotional value in this podcast. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> <Sweet>. <laughs> no, I'm no, just I'll, I'll, be, I'll be cooking up all those recipes, post them online. Yeah, love it. Good. Love it. Freediving for Spearfishers at howtofreedive.com will help you to extend your breath hold, understand your body better, and put you in a better position when you actually get to go out spearfishing. This program – is not for noobs as this program is for people who have some diving under their belts and understand some basic spearfishing safety but it's perfect for spearos who want a guided easy to follow and complete program with videos a clear process and a set goal the five minute freediver works get started for free and see if it's for you at howtofreedive.com there's a tester there use the code noobspero n-o-o-b-s-p-e-a-r-o to save some money if you do decide to purchase, check it out at howtofreedive.com. Freediving for spearfishers, a fantastic way to prepare, especially if you've got a big trip coming up. Get to that five-minute mark, and it does translate to your diving at howtofreedive.com. This podcast is brought to you by aqualite.com.au. This is the best solution bar none for staying hydrated in the ocean. If you're a Spiro, it's an absolute no brainer. It's a game changer if you're doing extended trips and the cramp starts to set in and uh, the old body's telling you, hey, that's enough. Just get hydrated and it will save you a whole heap of woe. It's a groundbreaking product that can help you to stay hydrated. It's got low sugar, it's less acidic than other options on the market, it's rapid absorption, help you to maintain performance. Dehydration of just one to 2% can affect your mental and physical performance by up to six or 7%. And as when you're spearfishing, you can tell when dehydration is starting to affect you because the equalization goes out the window. Get Aqualite at aqualite.com.au. It's scientific rehydration that Spiros know and trust. I know because one works there, and that's why we've set up this discount code for you. 10% off when you use the code NoobSpiro at aqualite.com.au. Check it out. Australian-made hydration products tailored 
for Spiros and a whole bunch of other people that suffer from dehydration too. But check it out at aqualite.com.au. Use the code NoobSpiro to save 10%. Handmade spear guns from the USA, killshotspearguns.com, have made rugged, functional, simple spear guns utilising the best components. Check them out at killshotspearguns.com. Save $30 on any timber spear gun. Use the code NOOB. Visit killshotspearguns.com. Mate, a, a few quick questions getting out of here. Yeah. Um, if you had to start all over again, what would you do differently? Oh, good question. Probably do a free diving course Faster. sooner than later. Yep. Or a spearfishing course with Noob Spiro. Yeah. I've heard about them. Yeah. I think I'd even, even like, yeah, if there was a spearfishing course when I was around, when I started, mm. I'd definitely do one. I'd even do one now because you just, you're always learning stuff, you know, learning yeah. from other people. You just don't know what you're going to learn. And spearfishing is a bit of a lifestyle. So even yeah. the like you were talking about on the pro sale trip, like the people you hang out with are a massive part of it as well. Yeah. And spearfishing does uh, attract a, an eclectic but cool bunch of people I find most of the time. There's very few dickheads around in spearfishing in yeah. my experience. Yeah, I, everyone I've been around spearfishing with or people I've speared with or trips I've been on with other people, everyone's very similar. Everyone's pretty chilled, easygoing. They're all like there for the same reason mm. yeah just good vibes all around from mm. everyone dream spearfishing destination oh i don't even know to be honest um you go anywhere in the world target any species oh i reckon maybe like the solomon islands or Vanuatu or somewhere you know like the shoot like your big pelagics like dog tooth tuna big big wahoo big spanish mm. yeah i think that'd be cool mm. i've shot a small Dog tooth tuna off um, Morton. Um, it was tiny, but like the fact that I shot one and let alone seen one, like the stoke was real, and we were just like, "This is so cool." But to shoot a big one would be unreal. But I think you've got to have the right gear for that. Yeah, you do. Yeah, you yeah. want to land it to uh, do yep. it justice. Mm, cool. Um, last last question, man. Um, for a person that's just starting spearfishing, what's your sort of number one tip for them? Um, I find guys starting out, it's hard to get in with like a crew or with people. Um, I think I think I'd say if for me, probably just having re- respect for having respect for the guys you're going with fishing with. Put in, show that you're keen to learn. Mm. Don't be a dickhead. Like um, and even even get into like a club maybe as well would help. Because you learn, you would learn a lot and get around more people, and yeah. Mm. There's a Twee Gold Coast crew down your way for if guys are looking for a club in that sort of area, yep. and we've got the Sunny Coast guys. These clubs are starting to thrive again too, which is awesome to see. Yeah. Um, so cool, Brad, mate. Absolute pleasure. Where can people come and connect with you if they want to? Are you on Instagram? Uh, yeah, I got Instagram with all I'm, those jewels. I'm pretty active on there. Yeah, I got Facebook, um, but I'm mainly on Instagram. Like, What's your handle on Instagram? Uh, Zulu sixty four. Zulu sixty four. Yeah, or Brad. Yeah. Cool. So. People can, uh, I'll link it up in today's show notes. So if they go to noobspiro.com forward slash Brad, I'll have your Instagram linked up there and um, a bunch of pictures maybe. That'd be cool, man. Awesome yeah, to go, um, to have a yarn with you. Yeah, appreciate it. Thank you very much. All good. Got a sweet deal for you today, guys. Go to freedivingfamily.com. And learn from Adam Stern and a select team of experts on different disciplines. There's Frenzel, Advanced Frenzel and Hands-Free Equalization, Mouthful, Deep Frenzel Equalization, Bifinning Essentials. These are courses that will give you the 1% that will allow you to improve. Use the code SPIRO to get 20% off any course at freedivingfamily.com. Again, that's the code SPIRO to get 20% off at freedivingfamily.com. Thanks, Adam and team. Love it. Imagine on your last spearfishing trip, your best mate never comes up from his last dive and dies from a blackout. Picture having to tell their family, spouse, and kids that their loved one died on your watch and knowing their death could have been prevented simply by being near them when they surfaced. Unfortunately, I've had many people reach out to me over the years and share exactly what that was like. I can't imagine anything worse than this. If you wanna make sure this doesn't happen to you, simply commit to diving safer. 
My name is Ted Hardy, and I'm the founder of Immersion Freediving, and I want to do more to stop the needless fatalities from blackout than any other person on the planet. And that's why I created freedivingsafety.com. If you want to learn how to reduce your risk of having a blackout, how to save your buddy's life, sign up for my free course at freedivingsafety.com. It is not a substitute for an in-person course, but it's free, comes from a trusted and reliable source, and you can start learning immediately. One month after launching this course, Aspiro called me and said he saved his buddy's life just from going through the course. His buddy blacked out underwater. He was able to recognize the signs immediately and was able to save his life. Jeremy Gamble, founder of Aspiro Magazine, said since he started hunting in cooperative teams, they put way more fish in the cooler than they ever did competing against each other. Dive safe out there. It's not even that hard, especially when you can learn for free at freedivingsafety.com. Hey guys, I hope you enjoyed today's interview with Brad Corbett, an absolute legend from my backyard and uh, a real gentleman and a, a great guy just to, I don't know, some real wisdom come out in this interview and I really enjoyed it. I hope you did too. Um, as usual guys, if you want to leave comments on any of these interviews, probably a great place to do it is our YouTube channel. Um, these often get uploaded as a audio only on the YouTube. So if you're looking for the video, though, go to the Adreno YouTube channel and this whole podcast is up there as a video. Leave your comments in there. It'd be great to hear your thoughts on anything and everything that we discussed in today's interview. As usual, my friends, a uh, massive thank you to the Patreon Legends helping to power this podcast, putting fuel in the Noob Spirit outboard. These guys are keeping this sucker afloat, I'm telling you. Hey, next week, I'm going to, or two weeks' time, we're going to have some interviews coming out of the Sunday's Spear and Sail Charter the inaugural one for me, uh, although Eckhart's done it before. Guys, we're going to try and run this thing annually. I'd love for you to come and join me next year. Uh, but, yeah, anyway, tune in two weeks' time and hear how it went. All good. Catch you, my friends. This review for Adreno.com.au from Brett, particularly the Wool & Gabba Adreno Superstore. I started spearfishing more regularly recently and Adreno not only has everything I need, it has Paul. He's super helpful, knowledgeable and kits me out each time with gear that I actually use. Paul has also provided me with heaps of tips that have made my dives better and more fruitful. He has the friendliest vibe and I would happily empty out my account upon every visit. I never write reviews and I used to buy gear online, but have now found in-store is much better. That review from Brett, it's up on Google if you want to check it out. Adreno.com.au, one of the longest running partners of the Noob Spiro podcast. Use the code Noob Spiro to save $20. In-store, online, go to adreno.com.au. Massive superstores, huge range of gear. Check it out. Absolutely mint customer service. Specialty spearfishing equipment, elite spear gun performance components, unforgettable reliability. You want to find out where to buy this? Punchaneptonics.com and shop at the best US spearfishing store, neptonics.com. Free shipping to the lower 48 when you spend over 199 and you can use the code NOOB10 to save 10%. This is your chance to save Dosh, buy deadly good gear, and experience A-grade customer service. Will you shop with the best? Visit naptonics.com. Use the code NOOB10 to start shooting 35-pound muttons tomorrow. Actual performance may differ from advertisement. Please refer to terms and conditions to see if you're eligible to be a legend like Shrek. This advertisement was not even endorsed by Jerry and the team at Naptonics. Hoorah and God bless America.